Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Since 1990, the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii has been following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education as we've grown to become one of the largest all-volunteer nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. It's now time to introduce our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight Michael Greger, MD. Michael Greger, MD, is a physician, New York Times best-selling author, and internationally recognized speaker on nutrition, food safety, and public health issues. He has lectured at the Conference on World Affairs, testified before Congress, and was invited as an expert witness in the defense of Oprah Winfrey in the infamous meat defamation trial. He is a graduate of Cornell University School of Agriculture and Tufts University School of Medicine. Currently, Dr. Greger serves as the Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States. His latest book, How Not to Die, became an instant New York Times bestseller. More than a thousand of his nutrition videos are freely available at nutritionfacts.org with new videos and articles uploaded every day. We are very happy to have Dr. Greger back with us in Hawaii. His presentation tonight is entitled, How Not to Die. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Greger. Good evening, everyone. Allow me to begin on a personal note. This is a picture of me right around the time that my grandma was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home to die. She already had so many bypass operations, basically run out of plumbing at some point, confined in a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. But then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is chronicled in Pritikin's biography. My grandma was one of the death's door people. Francis Greger arrived in one of Pritikin's early sessions in a wheelchair. Mrs. Greger had heart disease, angina, claudication, her condition so bad she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she was not only out of her wheelchair, but walking 10 miles a day. This is my grandma at her grandson's wedding 15 years after she was given her medical death sentence. And thanks to a healthy diet, she was able to live another 31 years on this earth till 96 to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That is why I went into medicine. When Dr. Ornish excuse me, published his uh, lifestyle heart trial years later, proving with quantitative angiography that coronary heart disease could be reversed, already opened up without drugs, without surgery, just a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle changes, I assumed it was going to be the game changer. I mean, my family had seen it with their own eyes, but here it was in black and white in some of the most prestigious medical journals on the planet, but nothing happened. Leaving me to wonder if effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else was there in the medical literature that could help my patients? I've made it my life's mission to find out. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so busy folks like you don't have to. I then compile all the most interesting, those groundbreaking, the most practical findings to new videos and articles I upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads. As a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother, 
New videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. So where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up through sub-Saharan Africa uncovered what may be one of the most important advances in health, according to one of our most preeminent medical figures of the 20th century, Dr. Dennis Burke, the fact that many of the major and commonest diseases were universally rare, like heart disease. In the African population of Uganda, for example, coronary artery disease is almost non-existent. Say, so wait a second, our number one killer, almost non-existent, what were they eating? Well, they're eating lots of vegetables and grains and greens and their protein almost exclusively from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in modern day plant eaters. So wait a second, maybe they were just dying from something else, never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, here's age-matched heart attack rates, Uganda versus St. Louis. Of 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction out of 632 age and gender matched autopsies in Missouri, 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our leading killer. In fact, they were so blown away, went back and did another 800 autopsies in Uganda. Still just that one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death out of 1,427 patients, less than one in 1,000, whereas here, heart disease is an epidemic. Here's a list of diseases commonly found here and in places that eat and live like the U.S., but were rare or even non-existent in populations centering their diets around whole plant foods. These are among our most common diseases, like obesity, for example, Hiatal hernia, the most common stomach problem. Varicose veins and hemorrhoids, the two most common venous problems. Colorectal cancer, leading cancer killer. Diverticulosis, number one disease of the intestines. Appendicitis, number one cause of emergency abdominal surgery. Gallbladder disease is the number one cause of non-emergency abdominal surgery, as well as ischemic heart disease, our commonest cause of death here, but a rarity among plant-based populations, which suggests that heart disease may be a choice, like cavities. You know, if you look at the teeth of people who lived 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavities. Didn't brush a day in their lives, no flossing, <laughs> yet no cavities. Why? Because candy bars hadn't been invented yet. So wait a second, why do people continue to get cavities when we know they're preventable through changes in their diet? Well, simple, because the pleasure people derive from dessert may outweigh the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. Right? And look, that's fine. Look, if you're an adult, you think the benefits outweigh the risk for you and your family, then go for it. I mean, I um, uh, certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence. I've got a good dental plan. What if instead of the plaque in our teeth, we're talking about the plaque building up inside of our arteries, another disease that can be prevented through changes in our diet? Okay. Now what are the consequences for you and your family? Now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now we're talking about life and death. Still up to each of us to make our own decisions as to what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously, We're educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, it is the disease that begins in childhood. By age 10, nearly all kids raised in the standard American diet already have what are called fatty streaks in their arteries, the first stage of the disease. Then these plaques get worse, uh, start forming in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then can start killing us all. In our heart, it's called a heart attack. In our brain, the same disease is called a stroke. So if there's anyone here today older than age 10, <laughs> then the question is not whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease, it's whether you want to reverse the heart disease you likely already have. 
But is that even possible? You know, when researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of plant-based diet followed by populations that did not get heart disease, their hope was that they could slow the disease down, perhaps even stop it. But instead, something miraculous happened. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies wanted to be healthy all along, but were just never given the chance. This remarkable improvement in blood flow on the left to the heart muscle itself was after just three weeks eating healthy. Let me share with you what's been called the best-kept secret in all of medicine. The best-kept secret in medicine is that sometimes, given the right circumstances, the body can actually heal itself. You know, if you uh, whack your shin really hard on a coffee table and get all red, hot, painful, swollen, inflamed, but will heal naturally if you just stand back and let your body work its magic. But what if you kept whacking your shin in the same place day after day? In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It never healed. You'd go to your doctor and be like, oh, my shin hurts. The doctor would be like, no problem. Whip out their pad, write your prescription for painkillers. You're still whacking your shin three times a day. Oh, it still really hurts, but oh, it feels so much better with those pain pills on board. Thank heavens for modern medicine. It's like uh, you know, taking nitroglycerin for crushing chest pain. Tremendous relief, but not doing anything to actually treat the cause of the disease. Our body wants to come back to health if we let it, but if we keep re-damaging ourselves three times a day, we may never heal. Right? It's like smoking. One of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training we said within about 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Like your lungs can clear out all that tar, and eventually it's almost as if you never started smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process starts until wham! Our first cigarette of the day. Re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite, when all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is just stand back, get out of the way, stop re-damaging ourselves, and let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. The human body is a self-healing machine. Sure, you could choose moderation and hit yourself with a smaller hammer, But why beat yourself up at all? This is nothing new. Look at this, American Heart Journal, 1977. Cases like Mr. F.W. here, heart disease so bad, couldn't even make it to the mailbox, started eating healthier. A few months later, he was climbing mountains, no pain. Now, there are these fancy new classes of anti-angina drugs on the market now costs thousands of dollars a year, but at the highest dose, may be able to extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. It does not look like those choosing the drug route will be climbing mountains anytime soon. See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and cheaper, they can work better because you're treating the actual cause of the disease. Heart disease is just killer number one in this country. Killer number two is cancer. What happens if you put cancer on a plant-based diet? Well, Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues uh, found that they could reverse the progression of early-stage prostate cancer, and no wonder. You take the blood of eating the, people eating the standard American diet, drip that blood onto cancer growing in a petri dish. You can suppress cancer cell growth by a few percent. But you put people on a plant-based diet for a year, though, 
and their blood can do that. The blood circling throughout the bodies of those eating plant-based diets has nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to suppressing cancer cell growth. Now, this was for men in prostate cancer. They wanted to repeat their study using women in breast cancer, number one cancer killer specific to women. They didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now. So let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks against three different lines of uh, human breast cancer. This is the before, cancer cell growth powering away at 100%, and this is after eating healthy for two weeks. This is what's called a photomicrograph, a photograph taken under a microscope. What they did is they laid down a layer, a confluent layer of breast cancer, uh, kind of a carpet of breast cancer. Then they dripped the blood of women eating the standard American diet onto that cancer, and you can see it kind of breaks the cancer up into these kind of cancer continents here. But then you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, and retest two weeks later. So same women, they act as their own controls, same women, two weeks after eating healthy, they lay down another layer of breast cancer, drip their blood two weeks later, and all you're left with is this. Just a few individual cancer cells left. Before and after, just two weeks eating healthy, their bodies became that much more hostile to cancer. Now, suppressing cancer cell growth is nice. Getting rid of it is even better. This is what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. Your bodies are able to reprogram cancer cells, forcing them into early retirement. This is what's called tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation or cell death, where dying cancer cells show up as little white spots. So, for example, here up in the corner. So even if you're a woman eating a really poor diet, you're not totally defenseless, so you can knock off a few cancer cells. But you take the same women, Put them on a plant-based diet for two weeks, and their blood can do that. It's like you're an entirely different person inside. The same blood now circulating throughout these women's bodies gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth after just two weeks eating healthy. What kind of blood do we want in our body? What kind of immune system? Do we want blood that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop it? Now, this dramatic strengthening in cancer defenses is after two weeks of a plant-based diet and exercise. They had these out, women out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. You say, well, wait a second. If you do two things, how do you know what role the diet played? So they decided to put it to the test. This is what we saw before. Um, this is measuring cancer cell clearance. Here's the uh, um, cancer cell clearance of those eating a plant-based diet along with exercise, what we saw before. This is a plant-based diet on average for 14 years, along with just daily mild exercise, like out walking every day. Plant-based diet and walking, um, that's the kind of cancer cell clearance you can get. Compare that to the cancer-stopping power of your average sedentary American. See a little cheeseburger there, I don't know if you can quite see it, um, uh, which is essentially non-existent. All right, but now this middle group is interesting. What about 14 years standard American diet, but 14 years daily, strenuous, hour-long exercise like calisthenics, they want to know if you exercise long enough, if you exercise hard enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over here? And the answer is exercise helped, no question. But literally 5,000 hours in the gym is no match for a plant-based diet. This is that same tunnel imaging we saw before. Even if you're a couch potato living off of fried potatoes, you're not totally defenseless. You can kill off a few cancer cells. Exercise for 5,000 hours, you can kill off cancer cells left and right, but nothing appears to kick more cancer tush than a plant-based diet. And we think this is because animal protein, meat, egg white, and dairy protein, 
increases the levels of a cancer-promoting growth hormone called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, involved in the acquisition and progression of malignant tumors. But start eating healthy, start eating plant-based, reduce your intake of animal protein, and your IGF-1 levels drop, and if you can eat healthy, they drop even further. And your, and your levels of IGF-1 binding protein go up. IGF-1 binding protein is like your body's emergency break. One of our ways our body protects itself from cancer, protects itself from excessive growth. Sure, in as few as two weeks you can drop your production of IGF-1, but wait a second. What about all the IGF-1 you have circulating in your system from the bacon and eggs you had three weeks ago? Well, your liver releases this snatch squad of binding proteins to type any excess IGF-1, pull it out of your system, and your um, protective levels go up within weeks. Benefits continue to accrue the longer you eat healthy. Here's the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 as the killer. Same thing we saw before, a plant-based diet and exercise, cancer cell growth drops, cancer cell death shoots up. But here's the interesting group here. What if you had back to the cancer, just the amount of IGF-1 you banished from your system because you started eating healthy, what happens? You effectively erase the diet and exercise effect. It's almost as if you never started eating healthy at all. So that may be why the, one of the largest studies of diet and cancer in history found that the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among those eating more plant-based because they're eating less animal protein, which means less IGF-1, which means less cancer growth. How much less cancer growth? Well, study of thousands of men and women um, followed for 18 years, found that uh, those eating lots of protein, middle age, had a 75% increased risk of dying prematurely and a fourfold risk of dying specifically from cancer, but not all protein, specifically animal protein, which makes sense given the IGF-1 story I just mentioned. The academic institution where this was done sent out a press release with a memorable opening line. That chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette. Arguing that, look, quadrupling one's risk of cancer? I mean, that's, what, one, that's comparable to smoking cigarettes. So what was the response to this revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy can be harmful to the health of smoking. Well, one nutrition scientist said it was potentially dangerous to tell people about this study. Why? Because a smoker might think, hey, why bother quitting smoking if my ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me? So let's not tell anyone about this whole meat and dairy thing. Shh. reminds me of this famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing your risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times as bad, 62% increased risk of lung cancer or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, or tripling your risk of heart disease by eating non-vegetarian, or multiplying your risk sixfold if you eat lots of meat and dairy. So, they concluded, let's keep some perspective here. The risk from secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday activities. So, breathe deep. That's like saying, yeah, don't worry about getting stabbed, because getting shot is so much worse. How, how about neither? Two risks don't make a right. Of course, you'll note Philip Moore stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. <laughs> Just saying. Top three killers used to be heart disease, cancer, stroke. Oh, that's so 2007. Now it's heart disease, cancer, and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like emphysema. Thankfully, a plant-based diet can be used to help prevent COPD, can even be used to treat COPD, significantly improving lung function over time. But the tobacco industry had a very different take on this um, study. I mean, if adding plants to our diet can improve lung function, wouldn't it be easier 
to just add plants to cigarettes, and indeed, the addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Next, they're going to start adding berries to meat. And indeed, I couldn't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. The addition of fruit extracts to burger patties was not without its glitches. For example, the blackberries dyed the burger patties a distinct purplish color, which kind of turned people off a little bit. Though evidently, you can improve the tenderness of lamb carcasses and infuse them before rigor mortis sets in with kiwi fruit juice. You can even improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds, uh, though there were complaints that the grape seed particles became visible in the final product. And you know, if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters is that they're picky about what goes in their food. <laughs> uh, oh, pig anus, oh, but grape seeds, ew. <laughs> Killer number four is stroke. Preventing strokes may be all about eating potassium-rich foods, but most Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum daily intake of potassium. By most, I'm talking more than 98%. More than 98% of Americans eat potassium-deficient diets because more than 98% of Americans don't eat enough plants. Potassium comes from the words potash. Take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce it to ash. You're left with potassium, potassium vegetable alkali. Um, uh, but who can name me one plant in particular high in potassium? Ban of course, bananas. Uh, you know, it's funny, I travel all around the world, and that's like the one thing everyone seems to know about nutrition. Like, did Chiquita have a good PR firm or something? I'm not exactly sure how that quite got out there. Turns out bananas don't even make the top 50 sources. Coming in at number 86, right behind fast food vanilla milkshakes. It goes fast food vanilla milkshakes and then bananas. It's still there. It's still there. Ah, but um, the USDA nutrient database has actually been updated. This is an old version. Um, they've since expanded it. Now bananas don't even make the top thousand sources coming in at number 1,161 right after Reese's Pieces. I kid you not. I kid you not. The most concentrated sources of potassium in our diet is number one, greens. Number two, beans. And number three, dates. Again, bananas aren't even in the top thousand. In fact, if you look at the next leading cause of death, bananas could be downright dangerous. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease is next. 20 years ago, it wasn't even in the top 10. Four million Americans affected. According to the latest dietary guidelines, for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease, the two most important things we can do is, number one, reduce our intake of meat, dairy, and junk, and increase our intake of vegetables, legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, fruits, and whole grains. This is in part based on data going back decades now, showing that people who eat meat, red meat, white meat, doesn't matter, between two to three times the risk of becoming demented later in life, and the longer one eats healthy, the lower one's risk drops. Killer number seven is type two diabetes, a disease we've known we can prevent, arrest, and reverse with a plant-based diet since the 1930s. Put diabetics on a plant-based diet, and uh, within a five-year period, uh, nearly a quarter of them were able to get off insulin altogether. But you look, you know, plant-based diets are relatively low-calorie diets. I mean, maybe their diabetes just got better because they lost so much weight. I mean, 
the only way we could really tease that out is you put people on a healthy diet, but force them to eat so much food that they don't lose any weight. Then we could see if plant-based diets have particular benefits beyond just all the easy weight loss. All right, well, we'd have to wait a few decades, but here it is. Subjects are weighed every day. If they started to lose weight, they were made to eat more food. In fact, so much more food, some of the participants had problems eating it all. They're like, oh, not another salad. Oh. But eventually they adapted, so no weight loss, despite restricting meat, eggs, dairy, and junk food. Okay, so with zero weight loss, was there still a benefit to a plant-based diet? Well, insulin needs were cut 60%, and half the diabetics ended off all their insulin altogether. Wow. How many years did that take? No, 16 days. 16 days later. So we're talking diabetics as long as 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later on, none. Diabetes for 20 years, and then off all insulin less than two weeks. Diabetes for 20 years because no one had told her about a plant-based diet. For decades, she was 13 days away. Here's participant 15. 32 units of insulin on the control diet, and then 18 days later on none. Lower blood sugars on 32 units less insulin. That's the power of plants. And again, this was with zero weight loss. His body just worked that much better. And what are the side effects? How about all their cholesterols dropping like a rock to under 150, making them essentially heart attack proof in only about two weeks? So look, just like asking people to make modest changes in diet will only get you modest gains in terms of cholesterol reduction, you know, how modest do you want your diabetes? Asking patients with diabetes to make moderate changes in diet can leave them with moderate blindness, moderate kidney failure, moderate amputation, maybe just a few toes or something. Moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing. Remember that study that purported to show that diets high meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to the health of smoking? Supposedly suggested that those who eat lots of meat, eggs, and dairy four times as likely to die from cancer or diabetes. But if you look at the actual study, you'll see that's simply not true. Those eating lots of animal protein during middle age didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes. No, those that chose moderation, only eating a moderate amount of animal protein, oh, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. Killer number nine is kidney failure, a disease we can both prevent and treat with a plant-based diet, and no wonder. Kidneys are highly vascular organs. Harvard researchers discovered three dietary risk factors for declining kidney function. Number one, animal protein. Number two, animal fat. And number three, cholesterol. Animal fat can alter the actual structure of the human kidney based on studies like this showing plugs of fat literally clogging up the works in autopsied human kidneys. And animal protein can have a profound effect on normal kidney function, inducing something called hyperfiltration, increasing the workload on the kidney, but not plant protein. You take people, you give them a single meal of tuna fish, and you can see increased pressure within their kidneys one, two, three hours after a meal in both non-diabetics and diabetics. Now, but what if you gave them the exact same amount of protein, but instead of giving them a tuna fish salad sandwich, you gave them a tofu salad sandwich? What would happen? Absolutely nothing. Our bodies can handle plant protein without even batting an eyelash. Say, wait a second, well, why does animal protein cause that overload reaction, but not plant protein? 
We think it's because of the inflammation triggered by animal protein. How do we know that? Because if you give a powerful anti-inflammatory drug along with that tuna fish, you can abolish that hyperfiltration protein leakage response to meat ingestion. Then there's the acid load. The consumption of foods like meat, eggs, and dairy induces the formation of acid within the kidneys, um, which can cause something called tubular toxicity, damage to the delicate urine-making tubes within the kidney. Animal foods tend to be acid-forming, particularly fish, which is the worst, but also pork, poultry, on down the list, whereas plant foods tend to be either neutral or actually base-forming, alkaline, um, counter, particularly dark green leafy vegetables, which is the best, uh, counteracting some of the acid formed within our kidneys. So the key to halting the progression of chronic kidney failure may lie in the produce aisle or the farmer's market, not the farm a sea. No surprise then that plant-based diets have been used to treat kidney failure for decades now. Here's protein leakage on the standard low-sodium diet. That's typically what we physicians would put people on with declining kidney function. But then they switched them to the supplemented vegan diet, then back to conventional, plant-based. Conventional, plant-based. Switching on and off kidney dysfunction like a light switch based on what was going into their mouths. Killer number nine is respiratory infections like pneumonia. What possible role might diet play in respiratory infections? So obviously, um, Hillary never saw my video, Kale and the Immune System, talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale cannot do? <laughs> Boosting antibody production sevenfold, but that's in a petri dish. What about in people? You take older men and women, split them up into two groups right before getting their Pneumovax vaccination, their pneumonia vaccination. Um, a half eat their regular diet, the other half you just add a few servings of fruits and vegetables. What happens? Significantly boosted protective antibody response in those that added more fruits and vegetables. This is not cutting out meat. Just adding a little produce to your diet can significantly boost your immune system function. Killer number 10 is suicide. We've known for years that people that eat healthier feel healthier. In fact, only half of the depression, anxiety, and stress scores compared to those who eat more conventional diets. Why? We think it's because of arachidonic acid, this long-chain inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid found in animal products, particularly actually chicken and eggs. Yes, beef, sausage, etc., but um, overwhelmingly chicken and eggs. And so if you take people, remove eggs, chicken, and other meat from their diet, you get a significant improvement in mood within just two weeks. Right? So what we think is happening is this arachidonic acid is adversely impacting mental health via a cascade of neuroinflammation, brain inflammation. But we may be able to clear up that inflammation from our brains in as few as two weeks by cutting down our intake of eggs, chicken, and other meat. Am I just cherry picking here? I mean, what about all the other diets that have been proven to improve mood over time? There aren't any. So this latest systematic review found only plant-based diets have ever been proven in randomized controlled trials to actually improve mood over any time frame. It's hard to cherry pick when there's only one cherry. <laughs> Works in the workplace setting too. This is at Geico Insurance. What they did is they went in, added some healthy options to the cafeteria, gave weekly educational sessions and got significant improvements, not only physical function, general health, vitality, all the things you'd, as you'd assume you'd get from plant-based diets, but also improvements in mental health. And along with that came an improvement in worker productivity, so that kind of piqued the company's interest. So they took this nationwide, 
across 10 corporate sites at Geico across the country, half control sites, they didn't do anything, the other half, all they did added healthy options, lentil soup, bean burritos, healthy food at the cafeteria, didn't take anything away, just added options and gave weekly optional educational sessions and what did they get? Significant improvements, depression, anxiety, fatigue, emotional well-being, daily functioning, emotional health. So, lifestyle interventions can improve mental as well as physical health, like exercise. From a dietary standpoint, plant-based diets have the greatest evidence to support them. Killer number 11 is uh, systemic blood infections. Sure, foodborne Bacteria can kind of burrow through the intestinal wall, get into your bloodstream, or in women, can crawl up into their bladder. We've known for decades that it's actually bacteria crawling up from the rectum that cause bladder infections in women, but we didn't know where this reservoir of bladder-infecting E. coli was coming from until now. Chicken! That's where these bladder-infecting E. coli are originating from. We now have DNA fingerprinting proof of a direct link between farm animals, meat, and bladder infections in women, and solid evidence that bladder infections, these urinary tract infections, can be what's called a zoonosis, an animal-to-human disease. You say, wait a second, who undercooks chicken? Can't you just use a meat thermometer, cook the meat through? What's the big deal? The big deal is what's called cross-contamination. You take 40 families, give them a frozen chicken to prepare and cook in their home as they normally would, and multitudes of antibiotic-resistant bacteria jump from the chicken into the guts of the volunteers even before they eat it. So you can incinerate that chicken to ash. You don't even have to eat any of it. You're already infected before it makes it into the oven. Within days, the chicken bacteria had multiplied to the point of becoming a major part of the person's gut floor. Chicken bacteria is like taken over. You say, well, wait a second, what if I use safe handling guidelines as well as safe cooking guidelines? Well, researchers went in and actually schooled people on the official USDA recommendations, which we're actually supposed to do is spray a bleach solution all over common kitchen surfaces. Not that anyone actually does this, but they instructed people how to do this. Then they came in and swabbed around their kitchen and found significant levels of salmonella, campylobacter, serious human pathogens, um, on some utensils, dishcloth, counter, rim around the sink, cupboard. The reason that people have more bacteria from feces in their kitchen sink compared to their toilet seat is because people tend to rinse chickens in the sink, not the toilet. So, unless our kitchen is like some biohazard lab, the only way we're going to guarantee not leaving infection around the kitchen is to not let it into our homes in the first place. Now, the good news is, it's not like you eat chicken once you're colonized for life. In this experiment, the chicken bacteria only seemed to last for about 10 days before the person's good bacteria could kind of muscle it out of the way. The problem is many families eat chicken more than once every 10 days, so maybe constantly reintroducing these chicken bugs into their systems, which can then colonize the rectum, crawl up, and cause millions of bladder infections every year, some of which can get quite serious and even life-threatening. Say, wait a second, you can't sell unsafe toys, you can't sell unsafe cars. How is it even legal to sell unsafe meat? Well, they do it by blaming the consumer. Raw meats are not idiot proof, says one USA poultry market biologist. Look, they can be mishandled when they are. It's like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's going to get hurt. Now, while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, or Poultry microbiologists disagree, saying, no, it's the consumer has the most responsibility, just refuses to accept. It's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kid in a seatbelt. The head of the CDC's food poisoning division famously responded to this blame the victim attitude coming from the meat industry. Is it reasonable? Is it reasonable, she asked, that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? 
Not to worry, the meat industry's on it. They now have FDA approval for a bacteria-eating virus they can spray on the meat. Now, the industry is concerned about consumer acceptance of these so-called bacteriophages, may present some of a challenge to the industry. So, of course, they're not going to label it or anything, but uh, if they think that's going to be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. The effect of extracted housefly, but this is a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat. Now, look, it's a low cost and simple, think about it. Look, maggots thrive off of rotting flesh. However, there have been no reports of maggots having any serious diseases. So, hey, they must be filled with some kind of antibacteria, something, right? Have you ever seen a maggot sneeze? I don't think so. So, <laughs> let's take some maggots, grow them three days old, wash them off, towel them off, a little Vitamix action here, and voila, safer meat. We talked about kidney failure. What about liver failure? We've known for decades now that you can both prevent and treat liver failure with a plant-based diet, significantly reducing the toxins that would otherwise build up eating meat without a fully functional liver to detoxify your blood. One does have to admit, though, that there are some people consuming plant-based diets with worsening liver function. Uh, they're called... Uh, alcoholics living off of grapes and potatoes and barley, and in fact, strictly plant-based, but not doing so good. It's not, we're not sure exactly. <clears throat> High blood pressure is next, affecting 78 million Americans. That's about one in three American adults, and as we get older, our pressures get higher and higher, such that by age 60, most Americans have hypertension. So wait a second, if most of us get high blood pressure when we get older, maybe it's less a disease and more just an inevitable natural consequence of aging. No, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. Blood pressures were measured of a thousand people living in rural Kenya who ate the following diet corn, beans, vegetables, fruit, and greens, our pressures go up as we age. Their pressures go down. And the lower, the better. We now have evidence that even people under 120 over 80 benefit from blood pressure reduction. So, um, I mean, if you went to your doctor with a blood pressure 120 over 80, you get a gold star, but we now know that even people under 120 over 80 would benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, 110 over 70. 110, is it even possible? to get down to 110 over 70? It's not just possible, it's normal for those eating healthy enough diets. Two years of this rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Zero. Wow, they must have had low rates of heart disease, right? Uh, no, they had no rates of heart disease, not a single case of arteriosclerosis. Our number one killer was found. Rural China, same thing. About 110 over 70 their entire lives. 70-year-olds, same average blood pressure as 16-year-olds. Now, Asia, Africa, vastly different diets, but what they shared in common is that they were plant-based day-to-day with meat only eaten on special occasions. So wait a second, why do we think it's the plant-based nature of their diets that was so protective? Because in the Western world, according to the American Heart Association, the only group of folks getting it down that low on average are those eating strictly plant-based diets, coming in at an average of about 110 over 65. Here's the largest study of plant-based eaters to date. Um, the Adventist II study, uh, looking at 89,000 Californians, comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or flexitarians, eating meat more like on a once-a-week basis um, instead of a daily basis. 
to those that eat no meat except fish, to those that eat no meat, period, compared to those who eat no meat, eggs, or dairy. And this was an Adventist study, so even these non-vegetarians were eating less meat than most people, lots of fruits and vegetables, tended not to smoke, to exercise. This is a very healthy cohort of meat eaters, but still, compared to them, we see a stepwise drop in high blood pressure rates as one gets more and more plant-based. Same thing with diabetes. Right? Now, so sure, you can throw the vast, same thing with obesity. So sure, you can show the vast majority of your risk out the window by eating strictly plant-based, but it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Any movement we can make along the spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant benefits. For high blood pressure, you can show this experimentally. You take vegetarians, you give them meat, and pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you take people who already eat meat, remove meat from their diet, their blood pressures go down within seven days. And this is after the vast majority had to stop their blood pressure medications or reduce their blood pressure medications. They had to. If you treat the cause, I mean, you can't have normal blood pressure and be on blood pressure pills. You drop your pressures too low. It could be dangerous. Right? So lower pressures on fewer drugs. That's the power of plants. Right? So does the American Heart Association recommend a no-meat diet? No, they recommend a low-meat diet, so-called DASH diet. So wait a second, when this DASH diet was being created, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? No, they, they were aware. The chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was created with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of a vegetarian diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. They didn't think the public could handle the truth. You can see what they were thinking, though. Just like drugs never work, unless you actually take them. Diets never work unless you actually eat them. Right? So they're like, look, we can't tell people to eat strictly plant-based. No one's going to do that. So if we soft pedal the message, come up with some kind of compromise diet, then on a population scale, maybe we'll do more good. All right, tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the American public the truth. Killer number 14 is Parkinson's disease. Does a plant-based diet reduce one's risk of Parkinson's disease? Well, most studies done today find this link between dairy product consumption and Parkinson's. Why might that be? Well, there are neurotoxic chemicals found within the milk supply, um, uh, various organochlorine pesticides found not only in the milk supply, but in certain areas of the brains of Parkinson's victims on autopsies. They're talking about pollutants like tetrahydroisoquinoline, which is actually what scientists use to try to create Parkinson's in primates in a laboratory, found mostly in cheese, actually. Um, so there's been calls in the dairy industry to pretty please test their products for toxins. Good luck with that. Of course, you could just not eat it, but then what would happen to your bones? That's a marketing ploy. If you look at the actual science, you'll see the milk does not appear to protect against hip fracture risk, whether you're drinking it as an adult, whether you're drinking it as a teen. Doesn't matter, doesn't work, may actually increase fracture risk which may explain why countries with the highest milk consumption actually have the highest hip fracture risk. So Swedish researchers decided to put it to the test. 100,000 men and women fall for years, and milk drinking women at higher rates of what? Higher rates of death. Significantly more heart attacks and strokes, more cancer for each daily glass of milk. Those women. Unfortunate enough to drink three glasses of milk a day, 
had nearly twice the risk of dying prematurely, and they had more bone and hip fractures too, more milk, more fractures, and milk-drinking men also had higher rates of death. But for some reason, we never see milk ads like this. I'm not sure exactly what's, uh, why not. <clears throat> And finally, killer number 15, aspiration pneumonia, which is caused by swallowing difficulties due to Parkinson's or stroke or Alzheimer's, things we've already talked about. Okay, so here's our 15 leading causes of death, and a plant-based diet can help prevent nearly all of them. It can be used to treat more than half of them, and even reverse the course of disease in some of them, including, in some cases, our top three killers. Now, look, there's drugs that can help, too. There's cholesterol-lowering drugs for heart disease, various diabetes drugs, insulin. Usually takes a couple different classes of high blood pressure medications to force people's blood pressure down. But the same diet does it all. It's not like there's a heart-healthy diet that's somehow different from a brain-healthy diet. No, a liver-healthy diet is a kidney-healthy diet. is a whole body-healthy diet. One diet to rule them all. And what about drug side effects? I'm not talking about a little rash or something. Prescription drugs kill more than 100,000 Americans every year. You say, wait a second, 106,000 deaths every year? That means the sixth leading killer in the United States is doctors. <laughs> the sixth leading cause of death is me. Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based diet. <laughs> Uh, no, seriously, compared to 15,000 American vegetarians, those that eat meat, uh, twice the odds of being on aspirin, sleeping pills, tranquilizers, antacids, painkillers, blood pressure medications, laxatives, of course, as well as insulin. So plant-based diets are great for people that don't like taking pills, for people that don't like paying for pills, for people that don't like risking drug side effects. Want to solve the health care crisis? I have a suggestion. There's only one diet ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, a plant-based diet. So anytime someone tries to sell you on some new diet they heard about, do me a favor. Ask them a simple question. Say, so wait a second, has this diet been proven to reverse heart disease? You know, the number one reason me and all my loved ones will die? If the answer is no, why would you even consider it? In fact, if that's the only thing plant-based diets could do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, uh, shouldn't that be kind of the default diet to prove it otherwise? And the fact that it can also be effective in preventing, arresting, or reversing other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and hypertension would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Most deaths. The United States are preventable and related to nutrition. The number one cause of death in the United States is our diet. The number one cause of disability in the United States is our diet. Bumping tobacco smoking to number two, cigarettes now only kill a half a million Americans every year, whereas our diet kills hundreds of thousands more. So obviously, nutrition is the number one thing taught in medical school, right? Obviously, it's the number one thing your doctor talks to you about at every visit, right? So how could there be this disconnect between the science and the practice of medicine? Well, let me end with a thought experiment to try to explain that gap. Imagine yourself a smoker back in the 1950s. You know, back in the 50s, the average per capita cigarette consumption was 4,000 cigarettes a year. On, it means the average person walking around smoked half pack a day, on average. The media was telling you to smoke. Famous athletes agreed. Even Santa Claus wanted you to smoke. I mean, look, you want to keep fit, 
and stay slender. So you make sure to smoke and eat lots of hot dogs to stay trim and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim. A lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh, right? Although apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings in many possibilities for a youth-oriented... They want to make apple-flavored cigarettes for kids. Shameless. For digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, look, no curative powers claimed by Philip Morris, but better be safe than sorry, and smoke. Blow in her face, and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> no woman ever says no. They're so round, so firm, so fully packed. <laughs> Look, after all, John Wayne smoked them until he got lung cancer and died. You know, back then, even the paleo folks were smoking. <laughs> and so were the doctors. Now, this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession. Yes, some doctors smoked camels, but you know, others uh, smoked lucky. So there was a little disagreement there. The leader, leader of the US Senate agreed. Who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink? Maybe over in Flint, Michigan. <clears throat> <laughs> but don't worry, if you do get irritated, your doctor can write you a prescription for cigarettes. This is in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So when the AMA is saying that smoking on balance is good for you, when the AMA is saying that, where could you turn back then if you just wanted the facts? What's the new data advanced by science? Well, she was too tired for fun, and then she smoked a camel. <laughs> Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science, that is, when he still could speak before he died of throat cancer. Now, if by some miracle there was a smokingfacts.org website back then, I could deliver the science directly bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters, you would have become aware of studies like this. There's an Adventist study out of California in 1958 showed that non-smokers at least 90% less lung cancer than smokers. But this wasn't the first when famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies back in the 30s linking lung cancer and smoking were simply ignored. He had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was everywhere. It was in the movies. Medical meetings were one heavy haze of smoke. Smoking was, in a word, normal. So, back to our thought experiment. If you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your smoking habit uh, not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until your doctor tells you between puffs to quit, you could have cancer by then. If you wait until the powers that be officially recognize it, uh, like the Surgeon General did in the subsequent decade, you'd be dead by then. It took more than 25 years. It took more than 7,000 studies on the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report against smoking came out. You think maybe after the first. 6,000 studies? It could give people a little heads up or something? Powerful industry. Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. As a smoker in the 50s, on one hand, you had all of society, the government, the medical profession itself, telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, all you had was the science. If you're even aware of studies like this, let's fast forward 55 years. You know there's a new Adventist study in California warning Americans about something else they may be putting in their mouth. 
course, is not just one study. Put all the studies together. What you see is mortality from all causes put together, heart disease, many dreaded diseases, stroke, cancer, diabetes, significantly lower among those eating more plant-based diets. So, instead of someone going along with America's smoking habits in the 50s, imagine you or someone you know going along with America's eating habits today. What do you do? Well, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your eating habits ugh, not so good for you. So do you change, or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between bites to change, it could be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the medical community still dragged their feet. The AMA actually refused to go on record endorsing the Surgeon General's report. Why? Could it have been because they were just handed a $10 million check from the tobacco industry? Maybe. So we can see why the AMA was sucking up to the tobacco industry, but why weren't more individual doctors speaking out? There were a few ahead of their time speaking up against industries, killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because of the majority of physicians themselves smoke cigarettes just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemic of dietary diseases. What was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies have proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? The food industry uses the same tobacco industry tactics, misinformation, twisting the science. The same scientists for hire are paid to downplay the risks of smoking and toxic chemicals are the same paid for by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risks of candy, and the same paid for by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. Animal foods and processed foods are wiping out at least 14 million people every year. Those of us involved in the evidence-based nutrition revolution, we have 14 million lives in the balance every year. Maybe plant-based diets should be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of stopping smoking these days. How long do we have to wait, though, before the CDC says, don't wait for open-heart surgery, before eating healthy as well? Last year, Dr. Kim Williams became president of the American College of Cardiology. He was asked in an interview why he himself follows the same diet he recommends to all his patients, a strictly plant-based diet. I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the question is, is it difficult for our bodies to convert carbohydrates into fat? It's not that it's difficult, it just happens very rarely and pretty much only in the liver. So, but if you eat lots of excess carbohydrates, you have someone, you know, they do these studies to have people chug um, quarts of Coca-Cola, and you can actually build up fat in your liver, and that they, all that sugar is turned into fat, um, and it just takes a few grams of fat in your liver to cause some serious problems, something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is not a good idea. So, don't drink quarts of Coca-Cola, even though it's zero fat, totally vegan, not good for you. Oh, that's a good question. The question is about, is there some addictive quality? I mean, the reason we were able to get at these tobacco industry documents is that you know, these big lawsuits where the industry was saying up until the 1990s that, oh, nicotine wasn't addictive, smoking didn't cause lung cancer, etc. But through discovery and these lawsuits, we were able to get at these documents showing that, oh, they knew this for decades. They were trying to increase nicotine content because they knew how addictive it was, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if a similar um, link could be shown, meaning that if the industry has data suggesting that indeed these products are addictive and that they've been manipulating them to make them even more addictive, um, uh, knowing all along that they're causing problems for people, that could be significant, and maybe public health departments could get 
kind of money back in these large uh, lawsuit settlements for some of the money that they're spending on childhood obesity and all the other problems. Um, so far, I have a bunch of videos on the current literature in terms of the addictive qualities of things like meat and dairy. Um, the science is still early, but you do see some really remarkable similarities in brain scans between kind of the dopamine systems of alcoholics, cocaine abusers, and people that eat lots of meat and dairy. Um, uh, and I would just refer you to the website and just type in the word addiction, and all that science will pop up. What about fish? Well, if you had a time machine, you could go back before the Industrial Revolution, things might be a little different, but unfortunately the aquatic food supply is the most contaminated on the planet. So if you're looking at PCBs or dioxins or toxic heavy metals, it's all basically our oceans are humanity's sewers. Everything eventually flows into the sea, so all the mercury released from all the coal smoke in the world, etc., all eventually settles down, and they build up the food chain. Um, such that, um, uh, unfortunately, one can't escape those pollutants, um, and so I would encourage people to, um, uh, to avoid, particularly larger fish, long-lived fish, these accumulate the highest toxin load, and if one, for whatever reason, wanted to get preformed long-chain omega-3s like DHA and EPA in their diet, they can choose pollutant-free sources by getting algae-based, algae-derived, um, EPA and DHA, which one can buy in supplement form, and they just grow algae in a stainless steel tank, and they don't, they're not exposed to the um, ocean elements. Um, uh, does one need to cook one's kale to get rid of oxalates? If you like cooked kale, cook your kale. If you like raw kale, eat raw kale. Um, uh, and I mean, the only people that need to worry about oxalates are those with a history of oxalate kidney stones, in which case you reduce your oxalate intake across the board. But kale is a fantastic choice, and you should prepare it in whatever way makes you eat the most of it on a daily basis. And the other question was, am I on an SOS-free diet? Who knows what that means? Salt, oil, and sugar-free diet. I am when I am home and actually have control over my diet, but often I find myself in an airport food court, and good luck. But it's getting easier and easier. Um, I mean, it's amazing you can find brown rice in airports these days. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, that that's just blows my mind. So I can eat healthier and healthier, and eventually, as more people uh, catch on and start eating evidence-based diets, it's going to be even easier to eat healthy when traveling. So I strive to, and certainly do at home, whenever I get to the, my favorite exotic locale, home. <laughs> Three weeks I get to go home for one day, and then I'm back on the road. Yes. Right, no, no, so what do vegans die of, is the question. Look, you can, you can still get hit by a bus. Like, I mean, it's not... Um, look, the, uh, we still have to, you know, wear our bike helmets, seat belts, practice safer sex, I mean, on down the list. There's lots of things that can get us. Um, and, you know, when, when you're looking at these statistics, when it says that, so for example, those eating strictly plant-based eliminate about 80% of their risk for high blood pressure or diabetes, they still have 20% of the risk of these killer diseases compared to the general population, which is just epidemic, right? So, you know, it, there's no guarantee. In fact, I mean, look, the reason we put on seatbelts it's not because it guarantees we're not going to die in a car crash. We do that because statistically it reduces our risk. That's the same thing with eating healthy. It doesn't guarantee you're not going to get a stroke or all these horrible things, yet, but it it's the most powerful thing we can do to reduce our risk. That's why we do it. And don't get hit by a bus. Um, and on that note, um, uh, let me uh, get back into the book signing line.
All proceeds from the sale of my books all go to charity. Thank you so much, everybody. I'd be happy to sign it for you. Thank you very much, everyone, for having come tonight. We hope that you have a safe ride home. Mahalo. Mm -hmm.